So today we're going to talk about Freud's unconscious. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about psychodynamism, because Freud's ideas about the unconscious relate to dynamic processes. So what does dynamic mean? And psycho we've already defined, right? Psycho is related to the mind. But what does dynamic mean? Something that's moving is dynamic, right? With motion, we can describe, if we go back to velocity again, something that's moving has velocity. There's a change in position over time. Anything else? So like Batman and Robin, they're called the dynamic duo. Do you know why they're called dynamic in this sense? What did Batman and Robin do? I hope some of you have seen Batman and Robin. How many of you guys have seen a Batman movie or a Batman and Robin comic? Or... Okay, good. So a lot of you have. What do they do? They protect the city. They protect the city. They fight crime, right? They do a lot of things. If you look up dynamic, you can find a couple different definitions. One is a noun, which is basically a force that stimulates change or progress within a system or process. So Batman and Robin, they are dynamic. They are a force to be reckoned with. On the other hand, we have dynamic as an adjective, which means characterized by constant change. Right? So something with a velocity is changing. It's changing its position over time. Other things are dynamic. There's a dynamic relationship between a teacher and the students, right? So some classes to me are a lot of fun, and other classes are like torture. And it has to do with the dynamic. Why might there be a difference in the classes that I am happy about and those that I'm not? Probably you guys feel the same way. Like some classes you enjoy, some classes you don't. What does it have to do with dynamics? Like it's active. Interaction. Yeah, it's active. The interactions. People are contributing. People are throwing their ideas out, right? So psychodynamic is basically the interrelation of conscious and unconscious processes then emotions that determine personality and motivation. It's an interaction. An interaction between the conscious and the unconscious. We talk about a dynamic in a relationship. It's the dynamic between one of the people in the relationship, a boyfriend, and another person in the relationship. The other boyfriend, for a non-heteronormative example. Uh, okay, so last, this is the last time I'm going to ask you guys this question. So why did you come to school today? Today I'm not even going to bother with letting you answer because you told me your answers, right? Basically, you guys want a job. Uh, some of you enjoy learning. You enjoy coming to my classes. Others of you are trying to appease your parents, right? So you have a lot of reasons for coming to class today. These all sounds like reasons that you're aware of, right? Why did you come to school? Well, I want to get a job. So obviously you're aware of this drive, right? But let's dig a little bit deeper. Why do you want the job? We talked about this before too, yeah? To earn money. To earn money, and why do you want to earn money? To have a good standard of living. To have a good standard of living, so you can buy food, so you can buy clothing, so you can buy shelter. And what do these things satisfy? Our physical needs. Our physical, our safety, our social needs. They, they satisfy hierarchical needs, right? So you want to meet your physiological, your safety needs. It's basically tertiary reinforcement. Right? So coming to uh, school, you are coming to school because you want a job to get the money to get the food. Right? You enjoy learning. Why? So some of you guys enjoy learning. Some of you maybe not so much. Curiousness. People are curious. And what does curiosity help to do? It brings new discoveries. Brings new discoveries. When we were talking about positive psychology, we talked about broaden and build. By being curious, you can learn more information. And this can help you feel better about yourself, right? You can build your self-esteem. It can help you self-actualize. So we label these things as drives, right? The physiological drives, safety drives, or needs. And we talk about them as if they're things that we're conscious of, right? I'm often conscious of the fact that I need to eat food. But really, Freud thought, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So Freud's unconscious, the ideas that he had about kind of the unconscious, is that most of the things that motivate us, most of the things that drive us to do the things that we do, we're not aware of. We 
are unconscious of it, right? So if you imagine all of our drives and everything that's going on psychologically in our head, we have a little bit that we're aware of, like the bit of the iceberg that's above the water, right? But most of the iceberg, most of what our brain is doing, we're not aware of. Make sense? This is actually a pretty reasonable interpretation of what's going on in the nervous system. We're not aware of a lot of things that are going on. Normally we don't have to think about, you know, am I hungry? Uh, is something morally or socially acceptable? Who's hungry here right now? <laughs> One person here, yeah. you've got a sandwich, good. Three people, did you have to think about that? You're like, hmm, am I hungry? But if you're really hungry, you don't have to think about it, right? It dominates your thoughts. You're like, man, I'm hungry. Where can I get a cheeseburger or a llama juice or something? Uh, do I find someone attractive? So people have a drive to have sex. We talked about that as being a physiological need. So uh, last semester, I picked someone out of the class, and they said that, that made them feel uncomfortable. So imagine that there is a person here. And there's a person there. And I find them like really attractive. Ooh, ooh. Do I have to think about this? Do I have to be like, hmm, are they attractive or not? No, it's, it's like, duh, dude, they're hot. <sighs> so we don't have to think about this, but it can be incredibly difficult to explain some of their drives. Why do I think this person is attractive? What is it that makes them attractive? <laughs> on one of the evaluations, since you guys are being a, uh, giving your evaluations today, someone once put something down like, uh, his classes are okay, blah, blah, and he's cute too, if you like that type. And I'm like, like that type? Like, what type is that? Like, you know, getting to middle age, chubby, white male, balding. Like, well, what is it about things? Like, I can point to some things. I never ever thought that I would marry my wife. Like, I like, if I have to describe like my ideal woman, they have red hair, red hair. I don't know why, I don't know why. It can be incredibly difficult to explain why I like red hair. I have no idea why I like red hair, but I do. My wife doesn't have red hair. <laughs> I also like really short hair. Why? <laughs> yeah. I have I have no idea, right? So I can explain that like, yes, oh, I would like to have sex. I can say, yes, oh, I find them attractive. Maybe they would be a good candidate, but I can't necessarily say why. What about that person as opposed to the other imaginary person over there? So Freud divided um, the psyche, or the mind, into three different components. The id, the ego, and the superego. So let's talk about the id, the ego, and the superego. What is the id? Basic drives. So basic drives, like? Um, hunger, it's a basic drive, right? It's something I have to do. What else? Anger. Anger. Oh! That teacher said that, uh, you know, I'm failing the class. <laughs> what else? Libido. Libido. Woo -hoo, that imaginary short haired redhead. She's really hot. <laughs> right? <clears throat> okay, how about the ego? Ego, the idea with the ego is it's based on reality. So the id, the idea is that it's totally unconscious. You're not aware of these drives. Actually, you can become aware of some of them, like, hmm, I'm hungry now, but the processes that are pushing you to be hungry, totally unconscious, right? They're driven by the pleasure principle. We need to get reinforcement, sex, food, air, whatever. The ego, though, instead is based in reality. It's logical. So it's mostly conscious. What is the reality principle? Yeah, based on society, what is appropriate to do? 
So this is related to social norms. So again, imagine that my ideal short-haired, red-headed woman over there uh, is there, and I am driven by my id. I want to have sex with her. <laughs> so, what do I do? Do I say, okay guys, five minute class break. <laughs> do I do that? No, no why? Forget the ethics. I mean, yes, but forget that for a moment. Because it is not normal in the society. Yeah, it's not normal in the society. Imagine that I have, like, really no morals, and I don't care. But even if I have no morals, I have an understanding of the real world. And if I went and had sex with that person over there who's not really there, what would happen to me? I would get fired at the very least. I don't know about Turkey's laws about nudity. Are there laws about exposing yourself in Turkey? I was going to say in America, if like a grown man and you know had sex in public, they could be arrested and sent to jail, right? So I don't do that, not because I might not want to, but because I know that if I do that, I'm going to get in trouble. Does that make sense? So the ego is based in reality. How about the super ego? My what? Extreme. You want something extreme. I want something extreme. Not sure. Maybe. So, like, uh, I want her extremely bad, so this is like super. Huh? Alright, based on the explanation, I, I think I'd have to say no, I'm sorry. Someone else can make it. I think it's just bad to disrupt the society itself. And wrong. Values. And values. Values. Like what type of values? Like I value my job, so I don't want to do it. Like family value. I mean, if you're married. Morality. Or in the marriage, for example. I'm married. I'm a married man, and the way that I grew up, I was taught that having sex with other people when you're married is not a good thing. So I have passed the conventional level of morality, and I still think this, at a post-conventional level, having sex with someone that's not my wife, not a moral thing to do, right? So this is something that's in competition with my id. My id is telling me, and my superego is telling me, right? So the superego, Freud thought most of it was unconscious, but some of it's conscious. Right? Think again about like why do I find this person like attractive? Why do I find it immoral to do this? Well, I can point to some things, but if you push me far enough, I'd be like, I don't know. I, it's a gut feeling, right? Indicating that what? That it's unconscious. And this is the super ego is driven by the ego ideal. Freud thought the ego ideal. What's this? what you want to be in the real world. So in the real world, I want to be a good husband, right? By wanting to be a good husband, then I would want to avoid doing this, if being a good husband constitutes not cheating on your wife. <clears throat> and this sort of acts as a conscience. Some of you guys may have seen cartoons where there's like someone and they have a devil on one shoulder, and they're like, oh dude, cheat on the test. And then there's an angel on the other shoulder saying, don't do that, that's not nice. So the id is like the devil, and the superego is like the angel. And you, the conscious you, is the ego, trying to figure out, what should I do? I'm getting these different inputs. How do I balance them out in a real world that's socially acceptable? All right, so let's talk about uh, masturbating monkeys inside saddles in, uh, in a minute. Freud was really caught up on sex, and it, it motivated a lot of his theories. It actually makes sense. I mean, if you look in the popular media, like songs, there's a ton of sex. Like, you watch a rap video, they're like, yo, I got this hoe, and they're like, woo-hoo. <laughs> or you even look at, like, uh, not videos produced by males, but the ones that are produced by females, 
and they're like, ooh, I got it, honey, my milkshake's bringing all the boys to the yard, right? <clears throat> like, it's a huge motivator. It's a huge part of people's life. Even if people aren't having sex, it's influencing a lot of what they're doing. Remember when we talked about the young male hypothesis, right? The young males, they're not married yet. They want to get married because they want to have sex in a socially appropriate way. So what do they need to do? They need to prove their worth. They need to go off and fight a war so they can be a hero and gain money and all that stuff. Okay, so the id wants it. The superego tells us when it's morally acceptable. It's not morally acceptable with this person that is my wife. Maybe it's not morally acceptable doing it in front of a bunch of students. And the ego tries to mediate between the two. Okay, so I want it, but it's not acceptable in this situation. So what can I do? Is there a way that I can get it in a socially acceptable way that also meets up with my ego ideal, that doesn't allow me to break my morality? So if you guys have been to the zoo, how many of you have been to the zoo? Good, most of you. Have you watched monkeys at the zoo? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen monkeys do anything? <laughs> That's, yeah. Like if a person was doing that, people would be like really upset? If you hang around at a zoo long enough, you will see monkeys masturbate. You will see them like pick up their poop and blood <laughs> at people too. Or, or maybe not monkeys, maybe you like dogs and you have a dog, a male dog, and it like comes up and it starts humping your leg. You guys seen that? Yeah, okay, so a lot of people have seen Why? Why are the monkeys masturbating in public? Why are the dogs coming up? Like, this is bestiality, right? Cool, it's kind of freaky, so you have this dog hump in your leg. Why? You don't have this super ego. Yeah, so Freud and other people could argue that they have the it, right? They're driven by the it. They want to eat, they go find food. They want to have sex, they go find something to have sex with. So you see like the dogs, <laughs> my wife has told me about these like three dogs outside in our uh, bache, and like they all try to have sex at the same time. They're very interesting. So they don't care if there's two or three or, or if it's a person's leg, whatever. It wants it. It doesn't have a super ego to say that, no, no, sorry, this is immoral. So it goes ahead and, and does it. What about side saddles? How does, how does side saddles fit in? Does everyone know what a side saddle is? So, imagine that this is my horse, right? So I'm going to ride my horse like this. Yep, 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 yep. This is, I don't know, normal saddle. But in a lot of countries for a long time, and even now, people, some uh, women ride in side saddle. Why? Yep, 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 yep. Or maybe yep, yep, yep. Why? To avoid stimulation, I think. Yeah, to avoid stimulation. Oh my goodness, the woman's vagina is right there, and if she's riding a horse like this, She's going to be sexually excited. Is it appropriate to be sexually excited in public? Well, if your morals say no, then maybe to avoid that... <laughs> so, your id is telling you one thing, your superego is telling you something else, and then your ego figures out a solution. Huh, let's ride a side saddle. Or maybe let's force our wives to ride a side saddle. Okay, so what happens when the ego can't successfully mediate between the two? Defense mechanisms. Why do we have defense mechanisms? To protect our ego. When our ego is threatened, how do we feel? Anxious. That's exactly right. So anxiety is a big problem. We can have anxiety in a number of di different situations. Imagine that we satisfied the id, but the superego is not pleased. So in the religion that I grew up as, like masturbation was immoral. It was immoral. I masturbated. And I felt really, really bad about this. Because like, my, I don't know, my id wanted to do it. And my superego told me, like, don't do it, but I did it. So how did I feel? Guilty. <laughs> anxious. I'm going to go to hell. Right? I felt really anxious. Or maybe we satisfy the superego, but the id has a scratched itch. Right? So I didn't have sex. 
and I have maintained my morality, but still, every class there is this gorgeous female. What do I do? Can create anxiety. Or maybe you satisfied both the id and the superego, but you broke the social conventions. I was trying to figure out like how you could do this in a real world example. I, I was not smart enough to think of one, but maybe you can. I think sociology class that seems to learn that the superego, uh, yes, uh, morality is a, a big component, but also the society itself. So if you are, uh, if your superego is maintained is good, uh, then uh, you're not, you're not supposed to break your social conventions. Uh -huh. So the so the social component fits in with that conception of the superego, based on the, the training that I've had the. The, the awareness of social conventions would fit more strongly within the ego. Perhaps. I don't know. If you envision it that way, then if you satisfy both of them, you shouldn't run into the problems. Alright, so if you do this, then you get anxious. And anxiety doesn't feel good. So the question for the ego is how do you cope with this? So what do people do to cope? They activate defense mechanisms. So, what are they? What can they allow? They allow us to avoid anxiety. Okay, how? Our life students um, frame for us. Okay. They let us do legitimate what we do. Like defense mechanism. So, they provide legitimate reasons for the things that we do? Okay, good. Anything else? Denial, it's one type of defense mechanism. All right, let's talk about the defense mechanisms more broadly and then we'll get into denial. So the defense mechanisms can allow the ID to satisfy itself in acceptable ways, right? So let's try to find a way to allow the id to satisfy itself in a way that's socially appropriate or morally inappropriate. Or we can allow our self-esteem to stay strong when the it is satisfied with disregard to the superego. So, okay, we did the thing that our it was telling us to, but our superego didn't like that. Is there any way that we can, like, assimilate this information to come up and, and be satisfied with ourselves, to maintain our level of uh, self-esteem? Or it can allow our superego to completely dominate the it. So, the first one that I want to talk about is denial. So, you mentioned denial. What is it? Deny the truth. You deny the truth. Can anyone give me an example of someone like using denial as a defense mechanism? Well, a lot of men, I guess, when they cheat, they, they deny. Yeah! Oh, no, no! I'm not a cheater. They're aware of the evidence, right? With denial, you, you're aware of what happened. Okay, so yes, I cheated. But I'm not a cheater, right? I, I'm denying the fact that I'm a cheater. Any other examples? Yeah? For example, uh, someone who likes to die, but uh, he's continuing to prepare uh, for him. Uh, yeah, so, so sometimes people talk about denial in a grieving process, like a failure to let go. So my wife is dead, but I deny that. I don't want to face the truth. I'm aware of the truth. I know that she's dead, but I don't want to act like it. So I continue to, you know, put out the dinner and imagine that she's going to come home because I, I just can't face it. So it's basically a refusal to accept the evidence. Other examples of addicts say, no, 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 no. I, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I can quit drinking anytime. No, no, no. I'm not addicted to cigarettes. I can stop smoking anytime I want. All right. Let's talk about displacement. What's displacement? Probably there's a sort of a source of anxiety uh, exists, but then you try to displace it to another place. So there's a source of anxiety, and you try to, you have some urge that it is telling you, and you try to put that urge onto something else? Is that what you're saying? Something yes. Else. Somebody else. Can anyone give me an example of this? I think it's like, okay, uh, he's supposed to be. Okay. Uh, Just know, everything's okay, hypothetical. You criticize me so much in the class that I feel very humiliated. Then I go to one of my friends and I humiliate him. 
Yeah, so like, I, I totally tell him how stupid his answers are again today because he's dumb every day. Good grief, man. What's wrong? <laughs> and he's really upset with this, right? So he can't really yell at me or punch me or take his anger out on me. Why? I'm an authority, but what else? I have power. <laughs> what do I control? I control <laughs> Yeah. You want to fight me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care about you, buddy. Yeah, that's the idea, right? So he's angry, and he wants to take out his anger, so what does he take it out on? Yeah, so he sees his friend, and his friend says something, and he's like, man, that's just stupid. You're always saying stupid crap, right? Rather than attacking me, he ends up attacking his friend. Notice that this, with this placement, this is like socially unacceptable. It's not a socially okay thing to do. So like my boss yells at me and then I come home and I see my dog and I kick it. And that's not socially appropriate. How about projection? Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. I think this happens a lot like in the family section. That the, the husband gets something bad in, in his office or in his work. Yeah. And then he comes to the house and then he starts having a fight with his wife. Yeah, lots of times. And not just for the husbands, but, but for anyone who's working. Often. They can have experience at work that makes them really, really angry. And they can't express that at work without risking potentially losing their job, right? So they have all of this anger built up inside, so they let it off when they get home. They take it out on their kids, on their spouses, on their dogs. All those would be socially inappropriate ways to redirect the id from one thing onto something else, right? How about rejection? Blaming others for your mistakes. Blaming others for your mistakes. Blaming others for your mistakes. Can you give me an example? Because I'm not sure I follow. Like, this is something that happened to me. I made a mistake. Okay. I was trying to transfer the reason to him that maybe it was the cause of my mistake. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. So, look, I didn't make the mistake. They told me to do it like that, right? Or if, if the teacher had made the instructions more clear on how to complete the research participation, I would be done right now. It's not my fault that I'm not done. It's the teacher's fault, right? Potentially. Other examples uh, could be things like, occasionally you'll hear people say things like this. Like, oh man, look at the way she's dressed. She wants it. Yeah, she wants to have sex. Does she want to have sex? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but really, you don't know. But instead, the person that's saying this, they probably want to have sex, right? So you have rapists say things like this. Oh yeah, man, well, she was dressed like it. She was asking for it. It's not my fault. If she wouldn't have dressed differently, she wouldn't have had, you know, this problem. That's projection. How about rationalization? Yeah, so the example that I gave earlier is sort of like a combination of the projection and the rationalization. So basically with rationalization, you're offering excuses for the things that you did. So occasionally, people will do really dumb things and they will try to not project their feelings onto someone else. I, I guess with projection, it's not so much of attributing blame, but projecting the feelings that you have on other people. So, like, she's dressed hot, I feel horny, so I say, aha, she's horny, right? Not so much that it's their fault. That, I'm sorry, that was a really bad example. That would be much more rationalization. So, uh, someone gets drunk, and they rape someone, and they say, it's not my fault. I was drunk, right? That's rationalizing. And this can allow you to satisfy the id, so you have the sex, your id's happy, and your superego, which is saying this is a morally inappropriate thing, can get satisfied because your ego says, look, it wasn't really my fault. Right? All right, reaction formation. What's reaction formation? You see a lot of this in politics and religion. Yeah. 
Could you say that again? Uh, the ads um, focused off our beliefs. So you act opposite of your beliefs or opposite of your desires, right? So you behave in an exaggerated way that opposes the source of the anxiety, that opposes usually the it. So, uh, Ted Haggard, do you guys know who Ted Haggard was? Everyone in the States knew who Ted Haggard was. He was a, a, a pastor of a very, very large church, and he was uh, an anti-gay advocate. No gay marriage, no gay adoptions, gay is bad, blah, blah, blah. And guess what uh, happened later on? Actually, it turned out that Ted Haggard, he was gay. He was having sex with a male prostitute. So, imagine, there you are, and you find yourself attracted to someone. Aha, that person, I like them. But you find yourself saying, no, 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 it's immoral to be attracted to that person. What can I do? Why well, can I make laws about it? No, this is wrong. Sometimes people that have abortions, they feel later on that this was really, really a bad choice, right? It's a bad choice that they made. So what do they do? If they have reaction formation, they become huge proponents for pro-life movements. No abortion. Let's make it illegal. Uh, monks and priests. So in the Catholic Church, uh, priests are not allowed to get married. So <laughs> imagine that you like are sexually attracted to people, but you think this is wrong. What can you do? You can join the priesthood. You can become a priest. And then you don't have to live with women. You just live with other guys, right? Think about uh, how religions often take modesty. So a number of you guys are wearing headscarves, right? Why? Because <laughs> of your beliefs. Because of your beliefs. What about? It's written in the Quran. Okay, very conventional level. Okay. It's written in the Quran. Boom. That's it. To, to avoid men. Yeah, be, it's, it's about sex, right? Freud was right. It's all about the sex. If you don't dress modestly, what will happen? That's right. Everyone will get really excited and society will, will like take a dump, right? So how do you avoid this? You cover yourself very well. And it's not just Muslims who do this either. What other groups of people do this? Jews, I don't know, maybe. A lot of cultures in the world. A lot of cultures. The, the so culture that I'm familiar with, in America, there's a, a very large religion. They're called Catholics. How do they dress? I mean, the like religious Catholics. Not the everyday Catholic, but the religious ones. The nuns? Yeah, the nuns. Exactly the same way, right? Exactly the same way. Why? Modesty to avoid sex, right? So if sex is a sin and this is a bad thing and it's immoral, what can you do? Well, I will dress in a way that, you know, will make it much more difficult for people to come and approach me. Or that will make it much more difficult for me to excite other people. Monks do this too, right? They go off, live by themselves, and they potentially avoid the possibility of having any conduct that could lead them to something immoral. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I do think that's a reaction formation because maybe uh, this woman who covers her head, maybe she's not, sex is not dominating her life. That's exactly, I, I, I totally buy that. I totally buy that. So I'm not saying that every person who covers is acting in accordance with reaction formation. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that every priest or every person that joins a priesthood is acting in, a, in accordance with reaction formation. But what I am saying is that the, the beliefs of a lot of religions, they take something that is viewed as bad and they try to eliminate the possibility that this could be a large factor. Does that make sense? So if men and women touching one another increases the likelihood that people will engage in immoral things, what can you do? 
I'm not touching anybody, right? I'm not touching any guys. Does that make sense? So it's not necessarily reaction formation on the level of the individual, but more of the like the development of the, the religion. But I think it's a good example of what reaction formation looks like in people. All right, repression. What's that? Bring it to the unconscious. Yeah, basically what you do with repression is you keep the id, the drives, totally unconscious. This is similar to denial, but unlike denial, you're not aware of it. So if I liked men, if I find, found myself attracted to men, and I knew that I was attracted to men, and I said, no, 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 I'm not attracted to men, that would be denial. If instead I say, or if instead I'm not aware of my attraction to men, and I just think, oh yeah, I like hanging out with guys, but I don't actually realize that I'm sexually attracted to them, that would be repression. No idea. How about sublimation? You make the unacceptable acceptable. You make the unacceptable acceptable. So earlier we talked about um, you know, I have a bad day with my boss, and I come home and I kick my wife or my dog. This is unacceptable, right? What can I do instead? Make up reasons to legitimate your action. I can what? Make up reasons to legitimate your action. Make a business? Reasons. Reasons. So when you say make up reasons, then I would say like, okay, I kicked my wife, but it's not my fault, it's my boss's fault. Rationalization. Is that what you're saying? Blaming her, for example, finding a reason to blame her. Like you say, oh, you did this to me, but that's why I'm doing this. Ha ha ha, so it's not me that's angry, you're angry, and you know, so I, I kicked you out of self-defense. I would argue that's more of a about saying that maybe you've gotten drunk from where you're coming from. At least you're coming from a party. Say that again? Saying that you have gotten drunk. Maybe you've taken a quality drink from the party. Okay, so I, I mean, made my boss, I drank, and I, I, I kicked my wife. Still, <laughs> what are you? It's maybe rationalization. You, maybe it is. You are intoxicated. You didn't do it intentionally. Uh, right, which is, would be rationalization. Making up excuses. Yes. What? Is there anything I can kick when I get home that's socially acceptable? That's socially unacceptable. Other people may differ, especially the dogs, because dogs are nasty cats. So. <laughs> I can kick the door, or I can get a punching bag, right? Uh, so with sublimation, you find socially acceptable ways to fulfill the id. So let's say you're really violent. Before I talked a lot about anger too, right? Anger, it's a big driver. I'm angry, I want to kill people, I want to kill this imaginary person, that imaginary person. I don't want to send you guys out, sorry. Uh, so I, I want to kill a lot of people, but I can't do this, right? How can I satisfy my head? Someone. I can write stories about killing people, right? Yeah, I can become the next Eli Roth and write Hostel Part 4, because Hostel Part 3 is something. Or I, I can become a boxer, right? and take out my aggression on something inanimate or on another living person that has chosen to do this as their profession as well, right? So I can satisfy my id sometimes in socially acceptable ways, right? So how do we measure the unconscious? This is difficult. Why? It's nothing that we can measure explicitly. I can't say like, oh, what is unconsciously motivating you? It's unconscious. You're not aware of it, right? So we need to operationalize it. The idea is that Unconscious drives affect our behavior. So if we can examine some behaviors that might influence the unconscious influences, then we might have an idea about what's going on. So there have been a number of tasks that people, that psychotherapists use to uncover what's going on in the unconscious. Free association is one of them. What's free association? Tell me whatever comes to your mind. First thing, just go ahead. 
actually that was free association. Like telling someone to say whatever comes to their mind, and they just sort of start talking about whatever comes to their mind. Anything that like pops up, any idea, don't censor yourself, just say whatever you want. If you have unconscious drives, then some of what you talk about should be about some of the things that your unconscious drives are pushing you to do. So the unconscious drives might pop up. Cute associations are related method, where like you might say one, or uh, the psychotherapist might say one word, and then the patient says another word. So say the first thing that comes to your mind, would, can you do this with me, Siva? I'm going to cue you. Coffee. Desk. Mother, don't answer the last one. So, if you have people, <laughs> like, like you cue them with words, based on how they respond, you can get an idea about how their internal state is. I participated in an experiment one time in an fMRI. The fMRIs, they're like these big magnets, you have to lay down, they hold you tight. Anyway, um, I, I told the people, that were going to work on me, that I needed to participate in a particular way. I needed to have my legs like this. So I have a back problem. I haven't been a doctor, but I'm not totally stupid. So I know that when I lay down like this for extended periods of time, my back really, really starts to hurt. And they said, oh, no, no, it's OK. We'll just try you like this. Forget about it. <laughs> okay, so they had us do this cute association task. They would present words, and we were supposed to say the first thing that came into our mind. So it started out, salt, okay, pepper, banana, orange, dog, cat. Okay, you know, the first thing that's coming to my mind. Anyway, I started to hurt. I started to hurt really bad. I started to become very, very angry. But these Experiments are very expensive to run. The machines are incredibly expensive to run. It's hard to do. So knowing this, I really wanted to participate. But my answers started changing. So they said, like, knife. <laughs> and I said, like, murder. <laughs> and then I couldn't think of anything else. Fire, murder. Mother, murder. <laughs> So they stopped the experiment and uh, asked me if I was okay. I told them that my back was in extreme pain and I needed to move my legs. And so then they like put my legs up like I originally asked and things were okay. But based on what I was saying, it gave them an idea about what was going on. And I really couldn't think of anything else. I'm done. One sec. Uh, dream analysis. The whole idea here is you can keep a dream diary and the dreams aren't co often consciously directed, right? You're usually not aware that you're dreaming. So your unconscious urges can show themselves. So recently, I've been having a lot of dreams about being separated from my family. Like, I, I might lose my family, I'm in America, and I can't come back to Turkey because my visa's been rejected, things like this. Why? Is this influence, or does this show you anything that I'm thinking about? Actually, yeah, next week I'm going to America. It's the first time in two years that I will be leaving my family. And apparently, I'm very anxious about this. I have several nightmares every day the last week about this. So the dreams are actually suggesting something that's important to me. Freudian slips, these are mistakes in speech that reveal hidden thoughts. So let's go to this one. George Bush said, our enemies never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. And people from the other party said, look, George Bush wants to hurt America. Here's the proof. He said it. Imagine that the imaginary redhead, uh, short-haired lady, she's one of my best students. She gets A's all the time. And she has a large chest. And at the last day of class, she comes up and she says, thank you, Dr. Knapp. And I said, it was my pleasure. You're my best student. <laughs> That suggests that I am thinking about something other than her academic performance, right? <laughs> the Rorschach inkblot test, you know, we're going to show people this ambiguous figure. What does it look like? It looks like a butterfly. It looks like a fox head. It looks like two guys from the Ku Klux Klan holding on to a naked lady, their breasts and her hands, and they're going to rape her. <clears throat> Based on people's interpretations of this, you might get an idea about what's going on in their head. 
uh, I don't have time for this. There are some problems with using any one of these measures. So one Freudian slip does not a racist make. So Obama said something about Jewish people and compared them to billionaires. Doesn't mean necessarily he's anti-Semitic. Uh, they could indicate racism, but it could indicate something else. So it's important to look across the measures. See if the Freudian slips that the person makes matches up with the dreams that they discuss and matches up with the cute associates that they mention. All right, next class we will talk about psychological disorders. Uh, now please stay and fill out the evaluation form.